We are here, Spartan Up the Podcast, Pittsville, Vermont. We just got out of an ice tub. We are frozen. We've got our rewilding expert, Sephra, here. I feel pretty warm. Well, you got that sweater on. <laughs> built we, fire. We've got Colonel Nye, and we've got Dr. Johnny Wade, who left his practice to come down here and do this for us. Um, we interviewed, who'd we interview? Mark Devine. Mark Devine. Seal, Seal Fit, yeah. Kokora Camps, writes books. Um, Ex-Seal? Former Seal. Former Seal, um, amazing guy. Ambushes me, as you just saw, and... Um, they really, they really crushed me. I got to tell you, they, they, these guys, and they only gave me a little taste. A little taste. Uh, to be fair, you had done some other things that day as well. I had done some you, other you, things. You yeah. had done some swimming, and you had done a workout uh, of your own. So, yeah. but all it being equal, they did crush you. They did crush me, and um, okay. you're you're gonna love this stuff because a lot of lot lot of talk about mental toughness. Um, not too much talk about foraging, or, uh, <laughs> or any of that. but I'm sure the seals have to use some of those primitive skills. Yeah, yeah, you know, there's a uh, wild food, seaweed's good, right? They're in the ocean a lot. <laughs> <laughs> seaweed's, seaweed's good. Very nutritional. <laughs> we are here, where is this, by the way, Santa Monica? Encinitas, California. We're in Encinitas, California. <laughs> we are. We are. We are lost with, track of time. <laughs> I don't know where I am. We are with Mark Devine at Seal Fit. It is the most brutal training facility in the country, maybe in the world. And um, he's an ex Navy SEAL, and he just tortures people sometimes for um, with love. With love. Torture sometimes, more. wait for an hour. Could be a class. Could be for an hour. Uh huh. Hour could, or two. Could be twelve hours. Right. Could be twenty-four hours. How, what's the? Well, we do. It's kind of modular, right? So we do have the twelve-hour. It's 20x. Pretty much anyone can do that as long as they're physically adept. And then we have the 50-hour program, which is model after Hell Week. That's nonstop 50 hours. Is that are they mostly prisoners that come, or is yeah, that they're convicts? <laughs> and, <laughs> no, people don't really people sign up. Show up with a gun <laughs> behind their head. Yeah. No, people sign up. This is interesting. I mean, there's it's, you've experienced this with Spartan. There is a growing, thank God, trend of people wanting to challenge themselves again and realize that the society. You know, the whole message that we grew up in is bullshit. That easy isn't better. Right. The, the single fixed pill isn't going to fix you. Right? right? And that the human spirit soars when it's challenged. And so, you know, I learned that going through SEAL training at 26. It changed my life, big time. You know, there was like life before the SEALs and then life after the SEALs. And so people who come here, they have that same experience. There's pre Kokoro and then there's post Kokoro. It changes them. They get, right. they get develop, you know, mental toughness and resiliency in this. It's like a... It's like a monster benchmark workout where everything after that is different. It's easy. Cause it, cause, so I like to talk about changing frame of reference. Do you think that's what it is? For sure. That's part of it. So, yeah. so um, you frame of reference is that they're, they learn that they're capable of 20 times more than they thought, thought they were. Right. And we endeavor to prove it to them. And we give them the, the skills, the mental toughness skills, to get through it. The difference between SEAL fit and Navy SEAL training is we want you to succeed. And so we teach you resiliency. We teach you mental toughness. And I've learned through my 10 years of doing this that you can actually teach those things. It's not just if you got it, you make it. You know what I mean? And if you don't, you don't. You think, you think somebody could be forged? I think you can forge resiliency and grit. Yeah. But you got to do the work. Right. You know what I mean? You can't just sit in a class and you're not going to... What do you, what do your dropout rates look like? How many people that start During finish? There are like 20 to 30% dropout, right. contrasted with 80% for the actual SEALs. Are, are, are the um, well? That's an interesting point. The, the seals, you're saying, they want to get rid of the weak. The seals are trying to vet teammates, right. and so if you don't show up physically and mentally tough, you're not going to make it. They don't try to teach you. The seals teach you tactical skills. Right. You know, the the buds program is: Do you have what it takes? And if you're one of the in my class, we had 180 start, 19 finished. Wow. So of those 19, we proved that we had what it takes, and then they teach us the tactical. And strategic right. skills of being a, a maritime special operator. Nowhere in that training did they teach us how to be mentally tough, how to be emotionally resilient. They didn't even teach us fitness. I mean, they tested they just, us. They just threw you they just in, into the fire. The whole time. Right. Because they don't have time to waste. They just right. want to weed out just, anybody exactly. we... Exactly. Right. If you don't belong in the team, get right. out of the way, stop wasting our money, you know, get through Hell Week, and then we'll... Then we'll, well, that's interesting. Given that, do you take people that are going into Hell Week and train? Quite a few, yeah. You do? So, I mean, that's how we started SealFit. I said, okay, I know how to train these guys, right? And so 
our first class was, uh, I think we had eight guys, and seven of them were SEALs, or SEAL candidates. Right. And that one guy, I was looking at him like, why are you here? <laughs> like, right. you know, you're not going to the SEALs. Why are you here? He goes, because, you know, I've always wanted to know. Can I do this? You right. know, and so all of a sudden, in the next class, they were like, we had ten, seven were SEAL candidates, and three, you know, guys like you. Right. And then the next class, why, 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 not, what do you mean guys like me? <laughs> <laughs> old, old guys who wanted to know. I got it. What it old takes. guys, I got it. Yeah. All right. So now it's like thirty percent of our clientele in a Kokoro camp, which is the fifty hour, yeah. are um, you know SEAL spec ops clients from all over the world, not just SEALs. The rest are you know Ironman triathletes, CrossFit Games athletes, ultra runners. They just want to know. The people who want to know. Do they have? Can it? I do that? And they also want to know how to do it, meaning they want the test, we call it crucible, but they also want the skills. And so, they, you know, there's enough information out there now that they know that we, do, we don't just throw it at you, we teach them. We teach them breath control and visualization and how to maintain, you know, mental focus. And you're doing that during the 50 hours? Yeah, we have a classroom on it the first night, right. and then we drill, 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 right. and we, find, we expose, you know, your weakness, and then before they quit, we drill them again and say, listen, get control. Focus on your breathing right now, right? And so we have this, you know, the, the instructors are kind of, they've flip-flopped, right? So we drive them hard and then we kind of teach carry them across the chasm, right. teach them the skill that's going to get them through that sticking point, whether it's emotional or, you know, you know mental, a mental block right. or even um, just not being able to rely on their teammates. That's a huge one. You know, sure. Our whole society is based on individual effort yeah. and you can't get through Kokoro alone, you know right. what I mean? And so a lot of people have to learn, how do I ask for help? How do I expose myself to be vulnerable? How do I, you know, as a big, tough SEAL candidate... But not, sudden, but not from your drill instructors, from the guy or the girl next to them. Yeah, not right? exactly. But the right. drill instructors will offer assistance when it's going to be a good learning moment, when right. it's going to add to their experience. Yeah. But they're going to retract it if they know that that person has more to get. That's a delicate line, right? Because, sure. because if you've got to push so hard that they're at the breaking point. Yeah. But you don't want them to it's, go over the brain. It takes master level skills. Like yeah. the, the SEAL instructors that we have on staff, they, they were all um, former BUDS instructors. They put thousands of students through their training. And then we've done this now for 35 camps. And <clears throat> they're like, like master psychologists. Right. And so we can tell like, very, very closely you know, who's going who's gonna to break and where they're going to break. It. Right. right. It's almost like reading an aura in the spirit. They can and look at someone you, and say, this is the... This so is right now, if 50 guys, women showed up, you think you'd be able to tell right away looking at them? Looking at them and reading their... Um, we make them write an essay, and we have them explain their why. You know, why are they here? And the way they write, the, the words they use, their self-assessment uh, is a really good indicator. You know, right. Whether you know what you got. Yeah. But, but at the end of the day, you want 100% of them to finish. Ideally, you know, we say that you will meet part of yourself for the first time during our training. Right. And that's a part of yourself that you haven't met before. You didn't know who that was. Right. And when you do that, then you become more authentic. You know, you become more um, able to communicate with other people. All right, so um, we're gonna, we gotta go, but we're gonna come back and talk about how this CPA turned into a Navy SEAL. I hope you're not sitting still while you listen. If you are, you better get a burpee break in. All right, uh, what else would you do when hanging out with a Navy SEAL? I'm going to get an ice cold tub. We'll finish we're what gonna, we started. We're going to finish what we started here. So, um, ah, nice and cold. Oh, yeah, baby. So, um, here's what's really interesting to me about Mark Devine here is uh, he was a CPA before he became a SEAL, which is pretty. Is it okay that the microphone is right in the camera? Are we good? <laughs> she tell me. I think we're, uh, All right. we're showing our. <laughs> A ranger is holding the mic. <laughs> so, so, ready? We're good? What's interesting is Mark Devine, SEAL fit here, was a CPA before he was, thank you for that, was a, and it is frigging cold in here. <laughs> he was um, CPA before, I'm just going to keep saying it because I'm so cold. <laughs> before he became a SEAL, not common. No, that's not common. Right. I think uh, probably the only one. You know, and I would actually rather go back through buds than uh, go back to be a CPA again. Really? I mean, it was like sticking needles in my eye. But yeah, I went, you know, I, I was an upstate New York um, guy, and I went to Colgate University, which is a small liberal arts school up there. Pretty much, you know, was stuck in the story of I got to be in business, family business. You know, my father has a business that um, is over 100 years old. 
And so I was kind of being groomed to come back. And so I got a job down in New York with a company called Coopers and Librand, which is now Price Fighters Coopers. Yep. They sent me to NYU to get my uh, MBA. And the whole package deal was, you know, you, you after two years I could sit for the CPA exam, become a CPA, get my MBA, work at all these diverse clients, and then they'd, you know, set you on path to be a, a more diverse partner. Because as an undergrad, I was an economics major. I didn't have any accounting in, in college. So though I wasn't interested in being a CPA, I thought it was a good deal, right? Sure. And about six months into it, I was ready to put a bullet in my head. I mean, it was just so painful. I mean, the crunch, number crunching, and I had no real interest in that career path. And I started to really just... It's a, it's a lifeless life, right? It, it felt really lifeless. And all my clients were big investment banks and the greed and the lack of um, honor, you know, lack of authenticity. Yeah. And so I, it was a really confusing period for me. And I started to really question, like, what the hell am I doing here, right? Why am I doing this, you know, getting up every day to put a suit on? And so I would find, you know, my solace was long runs in the morning, you know, hitting the gym and hitting the dojo. So I work out three times a day to try to maintain. And so finally, it was actually the martial arts studio that I got into where we spent a lot of time meditating before and after. And we had a 45-minute meditation session every Thursday night. And that was the first time in my life I really, besides being in nature, where I really sat down and just... What was your uh, martial art? What, 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 what? It was called Sato Karate. So it was a traditional karate, but the, the instructor, the, the grandmaster, the founder, was a little bit different. Like He was very much into warrior development. Right. And a lot of what I learned from him, uh, mental control techniques, the breathing, you know, I ended up using in buds training. You know, it, was, it helped me to become honor man in my class because it, it really prepared me mentally and emotionally to win before I even showed up at training. But anyways, what's, that, what's, yeah, what's, so the biggest thing I heard there was you made a left turn. Most people stay right. on track. They don't get off the, the highway. Right. And what I, where I was going with that is the, <clears throat> probably the reason I made that left turn, what gave me the insight was the martial art and the time in silence, the meditation part. Because you know, all this activity all day long, working, 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 mind going all the time, and it was those times sitting down in silence where I started to really take a look at it and say, what the hell am I doing, right? And the more I penetrated, the more deeper I looked, the more I realized that I was a complete misfit as a CPA. I had no business being there, wasn't interested in it at all, it wasn't my passion, and I started to think, well, what is? What could be the life for me? Right? And that's when I started to actually consider that maybe the, you know, something like the SEALs could be or should be a path that I could follow. And even at 25, I went through the you know, SEAL training at 26. Um, anybody can make that call. You know? and, and the whole idea that um, I like to teach you know, my SEAL candidates is like, it's a choice. It's a choice whether you become a SEAL or not. Because right? in that moment of quit, that's a choice right there. Sure. I went through officer candidate school with this guy. You know, he was gung-ho SEAL candidate been training for probably longer than I had, like three or four years, wanted to be a SEAL. He quit the very first evolution of BUDS. And he just, in that moment where he's like, this sucks, he said, I quit. And he had, that, that was a choice. And That's so a life-changing moment that lasts life forever. moment for him forever, forever right. right. And so a lot of people don't understand that your life is made up of the quality of the small choices you make moment to moment, yeah. rarely by the big choices that confront you. You know what I heard once was... Um, and when, I'm sorry, I'm shaking. I'm a little cold. It's so warm, Joe. <laughs> so I, I know it, it's the mind trick or something. But the um, and if you're on a spaceship, right, and you turn a dial just a millimeter to yeah. the right, no big deal. Except it puts you on the wrong planet. Yeah, exactly. Right, and so those, those <laughs> millions of miles away. <laughs> so yeah. the small decisions really do right. make a difference in life. Right. And so the key. This is kind of getting the essence of mental toughness. The essence of mental toughness is to to develop enough control so that you can notice. But when you're making those choices, especially wrong choices, unconsciously, we have so many rutted, you know, belief systems and so many things that just the, the entire story of our lives we just take for granted, and it's made up of all these little choices, moment to moment. And when you can pause long enough in your mental space where time really is irrelevant, you know, yeah. then you can start to look at those choices and say, okay, this is arising. Guess what? This is where it's leading me, and I don't want to go there. So I can pause, like literally. Eliminate that option and choose a new path. And but you got to do that moment to moment, you know. And we call those micro goals. And the and the, the shorter time frame you can collapse those, the closer you get to like pure 
um, you know, what, what the Japanese would call shibumi, which is effortless perfection, meaning moment to moment you're making the right choice for it's you in your life. Little tiny, adjustments, little adjustments. adjustments. It's getting closer to your goal, closer to your but do alignment. You, but before you do that, you lay out what the goal, if you don't have a goal. You've got to know where you, gotta, where you right. want to go. And you didn't know at I didn't that point know. where right. you were going. Right. Once you knew, then you were able to apply all these Then apply the other right. techniques, right. right. But knowing, you know, so that's the first step is like, like you said, knowing where you're meant to go. Right. Right. And see, this is an important concept, Joe. A lot of people think, well, I can set a goal, but it's not really their goal. It's like I had a very powerful goal to get my MBA and my CPA by the time I was 25, but it wasn't really my goal. Right. Now, the first real goal that I had for myself was to get the Navy SEAL tried, and that was like from my heart, that was from deep inside of me that said, that's what, that's what I meant to do. And I had naysayers all around including my family and my friends and everybody basically saying you're nuts you know you're throwing away an MBA CPA a really high paying job you know for that time of my life and um, and I had to put my blinders on and you know my earmuffs on and just say no that's right for me we interviewed so a guy yesterday uh, Stephen Pressman um, probably screws you up in the timing of the podcast <laughs> that it was yesterday but you'll see it someday um, <laughs> Stephen yeah. Pressfield, yeah, sorry, I'm, co- I'm very knows, cold. Yeah, Art of War, and uh, no, he's, he's uh, <laughs> yep. the War of is, War of Art, Gates yeah, of Fire, of Art, Gates of Fire um, is one of my favorite books. Warrior Ethos, Warrior ethos for yeah. the people yeah. out of the tub. Yeah. Um, but he said something interesting. You wake up in the morning, and um, right away you've got resistance. Yeah, absolutely. Not just your own resistance, you've got resistance from people around you, your yeah. own, and if you know that going in, well, then you just got to deal with resistance from right. the, the, the minute you wake up, right? Yeah, in fact, stress is just resistance. And there, you know, there is no such thing as, well, there is bad stress, they call it distress, and then there's good stress, they call it eustress. So essentially, you know, but you can't eradicate stress from your life, and we're hardwired to respond to stress. Right. You know, the key is to, to um, change your relationship to stress. And so that when you approach that resistance, you embrace it. You embrace the suck. You know, just like approaching a 50-hour workout like a Coro or a Spartan race or a death race, you look at that resistance and you say, that's going to make me stronger. I embrace you. You're my teacher right now, and this is going to be good for me. Now, it's going to be pain along the way, and pain is my friend, right? right. Pain is weak to sleep in my body. And so, again, the dialogue I'm using right now is, an, is a new relationship to that stress where I look at it and say, you know what? This is going to be good. And I, and I went into SEAL training you know, at 26 with that mindset, you know, and every day I said, all I got to do is get out of bed, show up with a smile on my face and be a good leader and be a good follower and just finish every evolution, the top 20, 25%. Don't need to be, you know, a miracle worker and then just get up and do it again the next day and the next day and not worry too much about what's going on beyond this day. I got to get through today. Yeah. You know, and then when it got really hard, it was this hour or get to you know just get to lunch i can just make it to lunch everything's gonna be cool now do you work from the tub <laughs> yeah you know i keep this full of ice all the time sometimes i'm checking my email in here and this is an interesting trick yeah. it's full of water yeah. <laughs> it's full it's of water deep, you're not breathing <laughs> <laughs> It's pretty cool. Actually, this is very comfortable for me. It's pretty cool would be a good way to describe it. <laughs> it's pretty cool <laughs> Can we get out? Joe's like, there are ice. There's ice in my underwear. That evolution, that breakout we did, usually goes for about three hours. Right. And then we pause and we have a little class on mental top and say, okay, this is, you just experienced, you know, combat. Right. Here's, you're going to experience more of that. Here's what you need to know. First of all, you know, the most important lesson for mental toughness is to know your why. Like, why are you here? So I'll go around the room and say, well, why are you here? And, and, you know, you would tell me, well, I'm here because I'm a father and I want to prove to my kids that they've got someone who's really strong who can be there for them in a crisis and I want to be an example for them. And I would be, I'd look at you and I'd be like, I'll see you on Sunday. You know what I mean? Right. That is an important, that's a powerful why. Right. And then I'll go and I'll see this, you know, like maybe 20 year old, you know, tough looking SEAL candidate and he's like, well, I'm here to prove how tough I am. And I'd be like, <laughs> 
I'll you probably see, see you, you <laughs> see you in three hours, you know, walking off the grinder after you quit. And so knowing why and connecting, you know, that why. It's like back to, you know, what we were talking about in that, that nice hot sauna, uh, hot tub over there. Yeah, the seal fit sauna. The seal fit sauna. <laughs> you know, if you're, if you're super clear about why you're doing things, then in every moment when the going gets tough, when you get kicked in the balls, you back. can say, you know what, this is okay because I know why I'm doing this and it's a worthy cause. Right? And that's kind of the first most, most important Most thing. people I've, I've seen uh, quit our longer races. Um, that's exactly why they quit. As they say, I don't know why I'm here. Yeah, I forgot why. Right. Why it, it doesn't mean any, whatever it is, and, and uh, they lost their way in that that's moment. Right. Yeah. They'll regret it later, but that, that's what happened. Sure. I mean, you know, we have a saying, it's better to live a life of discipline than a lifetime of regret. And the discipline is in managing your mind and managing your emotions, right? They're part of the same mind-body system. That's one of the things that we try to train at SealFit is we look at the physical training as simply a way to forge you as an, as an integrated human being. And so we like to, to develop you physically, mentally, emotionally, intuitionally, and spiritually. Right? And that means you're non-quitting and you're warrior spirit. That's where that why can be really you know, strengthened. And so the physical training, like a coral camp, isn't about working out. You have to know how to work out in order to do it, obviously. But it's about getting like, through your body to the mental and the emotional aspects of you and then to really examine that closely. You know, and people quit because of emotional uh, control issues just as much as they do as mental toughness issues. You know, I had one guy come in here and we were doing the actual physical screening test. Like maybe six hours into training, we're like, we decided, okay, well, you know, some of these guys really don't, they don't seem like they can do what they said they could do on their application. So let's test them. So the physical screening test is pretty simple. You know, it's basically you got to be able to do 10 pull-ups. These are the guy's standards, 10 pull-ups. Uh, you have to be able to do 50 push-ups, 50 sit-ups, and 50 squats in two minutes, and then run uh, a mile in, uh, I think it's less than nine minutes and 30 seconds. It's not that hard. So we go through and we start doing this, and what we realize is that about a third of the, the class, their standards were horrible, right? And so the push-ups, you know, maybe they could do 80 push-ups, but they're going halfway down, right? And, or they could do, they said they could do 100 squats, but they're going like this, you know? And we're sticklers for standards. who lot want to see the quality before quantity, right? And so anyways, where I'm going with the story is this one guy, he's going like a quarter of the way down, and I see that, I'm coming up to him, I said, no rep, you know? So no rep, no rep, no rep, and he's like, what the fuck? I said, no, you got to get your ass down, you know, beneath the parallel. That's a true squat. He's like, Ugh. you know, I can see he's starting to lose. So I move on to the next victim. And then along comes, you know, Coach Shane. And he looks at me and he goes, that's, that sucks. No rep. And he's like, Ugh. he's starting a little steam coming out of his ears, right? And then Shane moves on. And then Coach Cummings comes along and he looks at him. And he goes, no rep. And the guy goes, fuck you. And he ripped off his shirt and he throws it in his face and he walks off. And that was an emotional control issue. He quit because he didn't have the emotional maturity. Sure. And so, you know, when you look at a human being, they have a physical body and that, you know, we strengthen that. And then the mind, right, is more than your brain. The mind has to do with how do you, you know, how do you use your whole mind, you know, your heart, you know, your belly, right. and also that brain. And then the emotional part is really like stored memory. And so that has to do with your sensations and how you can connect with that and, and make sense of what you're experiencing. Is that anger something that's going to debilitate me from my mission. My mission was to get through 50 hours of Kokoro Camp. I'm experiencing anger. Do I turn that into determination or do I let it disrupt me where I rip my shirt off and throw it in the coach's face and that's it. Then a lifetime of regret after that moment, right? right? Because he lacked the emotional control. Sure. Interesting, isn't it? Same thing with intuition. Intuition is just being present enough to listen. You know, what's going on inside of you? I had this one situation in SEAL training where I was walking up to a range and I felt the word stop. I didn't hear it, but I was like, stop, okay, and I stopped. And then a bullet cracked off and went, Choo! just flew right by my ear. I could feel the air and I turned around and one of my friends had had an accidental discharge. You know, he's pointing his weapon right at me. He's like, oh, sorry, cyborg. I'm like, holy shit, you just tried to kill me. Had I not felt that word stop, you know, it would have gone right in the back of my head. Wow, that's amazing. That's, that's, being, that's being in tune. Yeah. I wish I would have um, felt that uh, before this interview. Yeah. <laughs> you would walk in the grinder <laughs> and, and, and felt the words. I had no idea stop. that there been, were bullets going to be flying here. How was that ice bath, Joe? Terrible. Why were you in there? <laughs> ice cold. Uh, they wanted to test my, uh, my ability to handle the cold, and um, I broke. 
<laughs> no Ben Greenfield, right? <laughs> no Ben Greenfield to kiss. No uh, Tony to fridge to cry for. It was um, those were previous podcasts you, you should watch. watch. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was tough. Cold water stuff. Well, it's cold water. That was freezing cold water. Those were, you know, they those kept were ice pour- cubes. <laughs> ice cubes that they kept pouring in. So you were essentially sitting on. So an you ice were not cream. comfortable. I, I gotta say, being not to pat myself on the back, but when I used to eat gluten, I could handle cold, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> Since I got off gluten, I, I, used- I, I imagine fat people handle cold better than I used to be fat. Fit ones, right? Yep. More insulation. More insulation. It's just, no, no, no doubt about it. Seals I, I, there's a pretty big trade off there blood. too, though, right? Well, without question, I'm not. I'm not advocating go out and get fat, so, but. <laughs> So he was, he's a pretty unbelievable guy, Mark, right? He was, he yep. was a SEAL for quite a while. He's got um, specific uh, concepts regarding um, how people uh, can use their brain to get tougher, to get grittier. Yeah, uh, I, I, I think this interview will surprise a lot of people because I think a lot of people might have a, a, a predisposition on what a SEAL is and, and kind of a special warrior, an elite guy might think of him as either more of the athlete or the knuckle dragger kind of guy and this is a very cerebral uh, individual yeah. and he's kind of thought through all of this and um, you know he was going to talk about the emotional maturity and the rest of it in the screening process they go through and, and exactly why he put this school together and who they're kind of looking for and who they're trying to help but when he talks through it it's with an understanding of the history of a warrior mentality and also almost a zen philosophy if you will, in, in that crucible that he's put together to kind of match all those things up together. Yeah, no, he does, he does a great job. Um, what were your thoughts? Well, it's funny when you mentioned the crucible and I was thinking that, that the idea of emotional maturity, I don't think you're necessarily born with emotional maturity. Some people, you know, have a bigger predisposition, but it's something that you earn and that you learn, right? You put yourself into situations where you become more resilient, you become tougher, you um, experience things that broadens your perspective on other things. And so the idea of emotional maturity and going in and training yourself for it so that you're not making a big deal about little things anymore because you've been in big deals and it prepares you for when you are. And I, I think, you know, the like you said, the... Uh, the jock who thinks I'm in pretty good shape, I'd be an awesome Navy SEAL, finds out that it's 90% up here, it's like like most things. Yeah. yeah. And it seems like, you know, certainly like a budge training or something like that is just this huge rite of passage, right? You talk about like the brotherhood and how close they are all after going through something where you're so comfortable being uncomfortable, right? If you can survive through that, if you can get through that, you have that, that bond. And it, it's really something that a lot of people don't go through. And um, it's just, you come out different on the other end, it seems like. Can we talk about, I don't know if you're comfortable or not, and, and certainly cut us off. Can we talk about the difference between the elite special forces and um, in the special forces, like we, the we, Rangers we, versus the SEALs? We, we talk about it a little bit. Green Beret. <laughs> so so uh, you and I, I was fortunate to watch um, Marcus Luttrell. What was the movie? Lone Survivor. Lone Survivor with you. Mm-hmm. And um, at the end of it, I said, um, you guys don't know this, I said, hey, Colonel Nye, um, I thought the SEALs would have spoken some other languages. And his response was, no, the SEALs are different than the other uh, elite forces in that when they show up, they're not really there to talk. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, you, you have, look, you have different different units within special operations that, that have similar and overlapping talents and capabilities, but, but they have core missions. And the Green Beret, the Army Green Beret, the special forces are really the guys who speak the, uh, the foreign languages and they're regionally affiliated around the world. And their job really is to be a teacher, an instructor, and go in and, and make those contacts with the indigenous forces, host nations, and train them up and then get them to where they're big enough, strong enough to defend themselves and defend their nation kind of stuff. Uh, the SEALs have done more and more of that since 2003. Everyone has had to. But at their core, um, they're, again, when, especially when we're talking, SEALs come in different flavors as well, but when we're talking uh, the elite SEALs, uh, there's not going to be a lot of conversation when they come. They're coming for you. Right, right. And, and uh, Delta? Uh, s- similar. 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 They're, they're, they're action-oriented. The direct action is their core competency. I love the terms, right? Um, target. Um, <laughs> there's not a lot of discussion. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's kind of wrapped in a bowed package. Well, right? it, 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 lots of acronyms. Yeah. Right. Well, all right. Well, let's get back to uh, let's, <laughs> get, let, let's get back to the training and what I really in the commonality of this video, some of the other podcasts that we've seen. He started Seal Fit with the intention or the intent, I think, of helping guys who wanted to go to. It wanted to go to buds to prepare them, and then as he said, there was a guy who, "What are you doing here?" And then the next course was three and more, and now there's more and more. 
much like when we were listening to Zach with the wrestling and a guy showed up and another guy and the rest of that. And so you just kind of start and you have one vision and that, that vision kind of morphs. But, but going back to, um, uh, I forget the other uh, podcast, The Why, mm-hmm. they do a great, he does a great job of screening, doing the pre-screening I thought was fascinating. Asking each applicant, why are you here? What are mm-hmm. you trying to achieve? Right. And for those guys that wanted to prove they were tough guys, he didn't have the time for him. Yeah, that's right. not what he's there for. That's yeah. not you know, you, you can go get a beer and go in a bar and find out if you're a tough guy or not. You sure, know, yeah, they, yeah. He wants to get at the core, the essence of why. Right, it's, it's, it's much right deeper reasons. than that. Right. Yeah. yeah, I'd see that at some of the races. Some people would come and say they're going to win and they're there to win and this and that, and you re- realize right away they're not even going to last. Yeah, and um, they've got the wrong why. Yeah, ego gets you started, but it doesn't get you over the finish line very no. often. No. no. Yeah, and you, you talk about that a lot, right? How these type of things expose. Um, you, you talk about all the time the people that even come to Pittsfield, right, and try to go through that, and then and then different things about themselves maybe that they didn't even know were there get exposed, and it's like the chinks in your armor, right? And a lot of times, w- once you realize what something that you don't like inside of yourself, you sometimes look for places to put blame and put put that on someone when mm-hmm. it's when it's really internal your own, your own obstacles yeah. that you need yeah. to that I, you need to overcome we, we have i think we have a negative selection situation going on in pittsfield <laughs> where we're we're inherently and this is not to um upset anybody who's come to pittsfield certainly not to upset you or <laughs> uh marion our camera person but um the people that come that we recruit not not existing <laughs> existing uh, people that live here the people that come to pittsfield that we recruit um are coming probably for the wrong reasons and they've got uh, we'll call them broken wingers. They've got a broken wing, and and uh, a very small percentage of them actually uh, make it through and act normal. Hmm. Our wilderness expert, <laughs> our doctor. I keep coming back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Does that make sense to you? I see. I see you uh, wincing. I, I always wince on the term normal. Uh, uh, normal <laughs> Me too. for who? Normal for what? It's a setting on know? a dryer. But, yeah, yeah. You know. So, um, so what what happens? Because this is my first trip here, and I guess tomorrow, <laughs> and maybe, maybe last, and maybe last, we'll find out tomorrow morning. Um, <laughs> what happens to some of those guys that leave here, or, or, or women, satisfied people? Well, so right away, um, we I'll give you some examples. We put people to task, and and those tasks are um, without much direction, and uh, they're Herculean efforts that are required. So go up on the mountain and build a cabin, and we'll supply materials and we'll feed them somewhat. <laughs> feed them some, feed them no somewhat. material, someone. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah you got to yeah. forge I mean, your own. Uh, yeah, we're not. You're not getting a helicopter, yeah. and you're not yeah, yeah. going to get a, a, a bunch of carpenters. But you, right. you got to you got to get stuff a mile up into the woods and make it happen. And um, the tasks typically are just too daunting. They um, they can't seem to prioritize. Uh, and before you know it, they're on a bus home. Mm-hmm. And not only are they on a bus home, but um, they're complaining about us mm-hmm. or the experience or the place uh, when in fact they were the ones that wanted to come here to begin with. Yeah. We've had uh, many, many alcoholics, drug addicts, and I have, uh, my nature is to help people. So I want to bring those people here and help them. But um, they they need a different kind of help. They, they it, don't need help that it, I can provide. It'd be different, too, if they thought they were coming to a resort and then yeah. felt they'd, they'd been duped. But, I mean, I've, I've heard you say to people, hey, if you want to come, we're going to make you work really hard. Yeah. It's, it's kind of like Shackleton's uh, ad, right? Uh, very little reward, a ton of hard work. Um, you're going to hate me. But if you do it, you'll find that you're a stronger, better person at the end of it. And then they leave saying, hey, that was a lot of hard work. There was very little reward. I hate you. And feel like somehow they were misled. Yeah. I, um, I, mean, not on, I don't know what happens when these recruits, these early recruits leave the SEALs or Delta. They don't make it. What, do you see some kind of cognitive dissonance where they're, they're blaming someone or they're upset? Or, or do they somehow come to terms with, hey, I failed? Mm-hmm. You know, it's interesting. I, I don't know. Um, there, there are a couple famous... Uh, famous guys. I don't. I don't want to embarrass anybody, but there, some some of the people have failed uh, selection processes and gone on to be extraordinarily successful, in not only not in life but also within the military. Uh, if you fail at uh, going through selection process at one of the elite units, you're not thrown out of the military because you didn't have to try out for that anyway. So you just come back down to the conventional force. Uh, w- one of the people who didn't make it through the army elite unit ended up uh, being a four-star general uh mm-hmm. you know they they take again a lot you know they take that adversity 
and they, they turn it around and they use it as a motivating factor. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so maybe yeah. maybe a few years from now, you're going to hear back from a whole bunch of these people who go out into life and uh, these lessons just took a while to take root. Well, we Absolutely. did hear from one guy, not, not that we have the time, but we did hear from one guy who came out from the U.S. Olympic wrestling team who um, cursed me, cursed this place for the entire week and it was here and weeks after. And uh, a year later, after not speaking at all, called and said, hey, I just won the Worlds. I, wanna know, I want you to know that weekend changed my life. Yeah. That's all I needed. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Ten second phone call. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We did our job. Yeah. Hindsight's so yeah. Hindsight's always twenty twenty, right? And I think a lot of the lessons that you're learning, like when we hear from um, Mark Webb in a in a future podcast, you say, you know, there's a difference in character between those people who maybe fail and they leave with their tail between their legs, or like they're able to say, all right, this is something I need to work on this, and you acknowledge it and you and you confront it, and then you come back, right? And you every time you learn more and more and more it, and elevate, and you you become more resilient as a human being. And it, it may be how badly you fail. Mm-hmm. Um, Years and years and years ago when I was in college, I used to miss a lot of classes and play racquetball. <laughs> and I would, get, I would get so mad and frustrated when I'd lost a match by a point or two. And sometimes I'd lose by 20 points and I'd shake the guy's hand and laugh and walk away. I wasn't, toward, I wasn't at that level yet, but when you think you're there and you can't quite get that last mm-hmm. step, that's, you know, it really it hurts yeah. to yeah. lose. That's when it really, when you know you can do it, Fitfo. It, it, I'm not, it, I won't yeah. say what that means, but. <laughs> well, the good news is um, there's 488 more podcasts you can watch to learn whether, or not, <laughs> whether, learn whether or not you have it or you don't or how to get it. Did you like this episode of Spartan Up? Go to SpartanUpPodcast.com where you can leave comments, you can watch videos, and you can learn what the other members of our team, Sephra, Johnny, Colonel Nye, had to say about that interview you just heard.